Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to you that are here in the church building with us and also to our online congregation. We welcome you and pray that this message will be a blessing to you as well. Last Sunday, I believe many of us were encouraged by having Isaac Khan with us, our guest preacher from last Sunday, who shared a fair bit of his testimony of his life and how amazing it is that just because of one person in Isaac's life on a university campus somewhere came by and just asked a simple question of him, would you like to know more about Jesus? And then his answer and further exploration of that and himself coming to faith made a generational difference in his family where his mother and his brother, who went on to become a preacher as well as Isaac, and this is the great news of the message of the gospel, that simply because one person, prompted by God's Spirit, with a passion and a heart to share Jesus, makes one questionable conversation, and from there, a beautiful outcome is in place. I know that many of you also have stories like Isaac's, and we can all be encouraged as we hear and as we share those stories with each other. So in whatever place you find yourself today, never underestimate the power of your story of coming to faith in Christ Jesus. Now, it might not have been on the lawn of a university or while your child was preaching but any time a person comes to faith, it is a powerful witness to the topic which is before us today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We endeavor to honor it each week as we open it and as we consider it. So Lord, help the preacher and help the listener today so that we might go from this place knowing what you want us to know. For I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm almost convinced that without a doubt, every single person that's listening to my voice now is thankful for God's word. Not only because it reveals to us the history of creation and reveals to us all of the interactions that God has had, but because it brings encouragement and it brings help to us in knowing that we have a loving God, a caring God that has made a way through Christ Jesus for us to be in relationship with him and to have a hope of eternity with God in glory. Now, God's word is not limited to expressions of assurance and value, hope and redemption. There is even more in Scripture than that. Within it, there are the challenges and the commands and the commissions that we are given an opportunity to respond to, not to earn or improve our status or our relationship with God, but rather they are calls for us to live out the grace story in such a way that we see beyond ourselves to the lost, to the broken parts of our world that are in as much desperate need of the hope that we needed uh, some years ago. So our topic today sees us focusing on some of Jesus' last words that are recorded in Scripture. Jesus has been on planet Earth for 33 years. We're very familiar with the miraculous beginning of Jesus' life. Believers, no doubt, enjoy the Bethlehem story and how the miracle of the virgin birth of Christ draws, drew the people of that day and even ourselves to take note of that amazing conception of Christ and how he came into this world. The gospel writers share similar but not identical snippets of Jesus' um, family and his earliest years. You might recall that time when he was taken to the temple when he was around about um, just a few weeks old and the prophet Simeon uh, spoke these words in Luke 2. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God. Lord, I am your servant and now I can die in peace 
because you have kept your promise to me. With my own eyes, I have seen what you have done to save your people. And these are one of the affirmation stories that a prophecy given to Simeon so many years ago was realized and he actually got to hold this baby Jesus. And for him then, he was able to die in peace. As many of us now, because of that same birth, are able to also face and to die in peace ourselves. We recall some more of Jesus' early life when at the age of 12, while visiting the temple in Jerusalem with his parents believing that he had traveled with somebody else. No, he's left at the temple. And Luke records these words in chapter 2. Three days later, they found Jesus sitting in the temple, listening to the teachers and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was surprised at how much he knew and at the answers he gave. And while hardly a thing is recorded of Jesus' life from age 12, for almost 20 years, his recorded public ministry begins with two very significant events. The first being his first miracle, when at a wedding he does what some might say is unbelievable when he intervenes in a catering crisis by providing the miracle of water to wine. And the second outstanding matter occurs when Jesus enters the temple, is handed the Old Testament scriptures and reads from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Luke also records this in chapter 4. Jesus went back to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as usual, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. When he stood up to read from the scriptures, he was given the book of Isaiah the prophet. He opened it and read, The Lord's Spirit has come to me because he has chosen me to tell the good news to the poor. The Lord has sent me to announce freedom for prisoners, to give sight to the blind, to free everyone who suffers and to say, this is the year the Lord has chosen. Jesus closed the book. Then he handed it back to the man in charge and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue looked straight at Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, what you have just heard me read has come true today. And so began the public ministry of Christ. But this is not a ministry which began on that day. This is a ministry and a plan that has been a mission of God that has been in place ever since the fall which occurred in the Garden of Eden some 3,000 years before that time. But this was the realization, at least of the public expression, that Jesus was the one that was coming to share this good news, to bring freedom, to bring healing, and to bring hope and salvation to a lost world. And it's like from that moment that all heaven breaks loose as Jesus, with a clarity of purpose and resolve, lives out his mission, lives out his commission. For the next three years, Jesus did not waver. He was direct, true, passionate, and dare I say, driven to do exactly what God himself had always planned for him. The redemption, the rescue, the salvation for all who would but simply place their trust and belief in him. All four gospel writers spend time recording this Short ministry of Jesus. And when we think about it, it was a very, very short ministry. I've been at the church here just over four years. Jesus' total public ministry was just three years. And even as we look at Scripture, there is such a small amount that's recorded about what he did. And what an amazing ministry this was. Approximately three years from the temple to transfiguration, just 10% of his entire life is covered by the gospel writers. Yet his life testimony is still affecting so much of our world. And as Jesus' final days unfold, we see the ending of something and the beginning of something. 
And it's just like as Elisha, one of the Old Testament prophets, takes up the mantle, the ministry of Elijah, when Elijah died, so Christ is going to hand over a mantle in the first instance to his apostles, and then by inference, the body of believers. He's going to hand over the hopes and plans of Almighty God that the legacy of Christ's redeeming act of glory does not die within a generation or two. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's revealed himself in various ways to many different groups of people. He has unequivocally demonstrated his unique place as Messiah, the redeeming one, the Son of God. And now the end of his time with humanity on earth is about to finish. And just as they was at the Last Supper, just as there was at the foot of the cross, just as there was for those three days in the tomb, his followers are coming to another occasion when they're going to be shocked, perhaps dismayed, and then left to consider the legacy and the commission of Christ. Luke, once again, in chapter 24, describes it like this. But Jesus said, Why are you so frightened? Why do you doubt? Look at my hands and my feet and see who I am. Touch me and find out for yourselves. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones as you see I have. After Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. The disciples were so glad and amazed that they could not believe it. Jesus then asked them, do you have something to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it as they watched. Jesus said to them, while I was still with you, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the books of the prophets and the Psalms had to happen. Then he helped them to understand the scriptures. He told them, the scriptures say that the Messiah must suffer. Then three days later, he will rise from dead. They also say that all people of every nation must be told in my name to turn to God in order to be forgiven. So beginning in Jerusalem, you must tell everything that has happened. I will send you the one my father has promised and you must stay in the city until you have been given power from heaven. And so it is that all of the necessary preparations have been made for this mission transition to occur. For the mantle, for the cloak of God's eternal rescue mission will fall from Christ and land squarely at the feet of the apostles and the church, which is about to be birthed 10 days later at Pentecost. The scene is set. Jesus has done all that is necessary. His earthly work is totally complete. There is not a necessary word of his that has not been unsaid. There are no more signs to be shown. He truly was the son of God. And within, it would seem, within moments of his return journey to Father God, Jesus calls the 11 together on a mountain in Galilee and he gives a commission. Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to do everything I have told you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. And that pretty much concludes the earthly mission of Christ Jesus. And what you and I have observed over the past 2,000 odd years, is the outworking of those words that Jesus said. The outworking of the Great Commission. Now, I've said this before, but it's worth noting that while the Great Commandment is given that title in Scripture, it is not so with the words Great Commission. Both Great and Commission are man's feeble attempts 
to encapsulate Jesus' words that are recorded here in Matthew 28. Now, I'm sure that Jesus, if he was the one to give a title to it all, could have done a way better job in giving it a title. But our description is a pretty reasonable one, I believe. Great. Describing adjective for commission. What sort of a commission is this to go into all the world? It is a great one. Great for many reasons. Because it's a huge commission. And because of the content that is within the commission, it is great. Go to all people in all nations and lead them to follow Jesus fully and faithfully for all their days. Now, humanly speaking, this could be just as well described as an impossible commission instead of a great commission, as it is incredible in its breadth and depth. Impossible without what we call the day of Pentecost event, which is going to occur 10 days after Jesus gives this commission. And just as God's Spirit was upon Christ, within Christ, so that empowering and leading presence of God's Spirit is going to be giving us the recipients of this awesome commission the strength and the ability to step into this commission and to do as Christ has asked. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, giving birth to the disciples and us exactly what we need, but the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. Then you will tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere in the world. So the forefathers of our faith, Abraham and, and co., the kings of Israel, David and co. The major and the minor prophets, like Isaiah and Malachi, all did exactly what was necessary in this journey of God's mission to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. And then Jesus did all that was necessary for the redemptive story to have effect. And the apostles did what was necessary And throughout the book of Acts, we see the early church with the apostles, teachers, and evangelists doing what was needed for the ongoing generational effect of Christ's death and resurrection to be in accordance with God's mission. And since the conclusion of the inspired word of God, the written down and collated group of books that we call the Bible, many followers of Christ have done their part in serving And seeing the Great Commission continue. Now there's not a single one of us here today or watching online that are not the direct beneficiaries of these people in the first instance doing exactly what Jesus asked them. And then thousands of people over generations have carried on in sharing this story which started from the Garden of Eden all the way through our forefathers and our prophets, all the way through Jesus, the apostles, the early church, and faithful witnesses to the message of Christ. And now today, 26 February 2023, it's our turn. We have the privilege of being a part of this great redemptive commission which began so long ago and will continue until the Lord returns. And all followers of Christ cannot escape, push to the side, or ignore this ongoing commission. And I believe that actually simply by being here, being an active part of this church, you are a part of the lineage of faithful Christians that have enabled the message of God's grace to be shared. Yes, they're may have been a time in your life when you could have done a lot more of the go part of the Great Commission than what you might be able to do now. In fact, some in our church have gone to other countries as missionaries. Solomon Islands, South America, Africa, China, and other places as well. There may even be some in our church that are still thinking of heading overseas on mission to be a part of this great commission. 
Many of you have gone to places like beach mission outreaches or RI in schools or youth camps or you've shared in Sunday schools. Others of you have done the work of an evangelist and you are still doing that from preaching on a street corner to simply sharing your faith with an inquirer. Yes, perhaps a lack of mobility today and our age means we cannot do as much of this going as we used to do. Yet we can continue to be a part of the sending, this great commission, helping support through prayer and finances that enables others to still go. As an example, simply as you give an offering in this church, you are helping to provide for three pastors in Zimbabwe who are preaching the gospel there. Your support goes to five different school chaplains in our area. Your giving is enabling mission organizations like Mercy Ships and Destiny Rescue, Barnabas Fund, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, Global Mission Partners, Gideons, Reach Beyond, and SIM, enabling them to get on with this commission which was given by Jesus 2,000 years ago. Your giving enables the sending of those who are doing what we cannot do. And our participation in the Great Commission is still effective as we play the part that we do in prayer, in writing letters of encouragement and in giving. And despite changing circumstances, every believer has the joy of telling God's story. Not only God's story, but how God's story has changed your life. Whether you're a new resident moving into an aged care home or as a student at school or university or as a neighbor, you get the privilege and opportunity to tell his story and how that has changed your life. From the beginning of time, God has been on mission to restore broken relationships. One that we broke through sin. And as the Holy Spirit gifts us, so the church can continue to be fit for the purpose of God as we participate in the Great Commission. To be continued. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, right now I'd like you to help us to remember that moment when the gospel message was spoken to us and it became alive in our lives. And as we recall that moment, we want to give thanks for faithful people who saw this great commission as not something which ended with Jesus, ended with the apostles, or ended with the first church but rather it is continuing. So help us, Lord, as recipients of this wonderful gift. Go from this place encouraged to continue your mission 